just points to Jesus. Jesus Christ is, is, is all we've got. And when you realize he's all you got, you understand he's all you need, and you don't need anything else. Amen? It's good to just guard, uh, guard our hearts against anything that would speak against that, and that's why it's good to sing. To remember communion, John, thank you for leading us. John's one of our deacons here, and uh, it's easy to get choked up, isn't it? And uh, to talk about the thing that is most precious to us. And, uh, and he talked about a new baby, and I'm looking over there at little Miranda, and she's just snoozing. And I'm thinking, what a picture for us to rest that secure in the love of, of Christ. Amen? We're no longer slaves to fear, but we are now sons and daughters of the King. And we're going to revisit that theme here in a bit. But uh, turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. We're going to cover a chapter and a half this morning and talk about Noah and the ark and the flood. So turn to Genesis 6. We're going to look at cha chapter 6, chapter 7. Um, have you ever built something and come to a place where you realize, I can't go any further, I've got to tear this down and start again? Have you ever started out on a project and you've invested so much time, so many resources, so much energy, and you came to a point and you, as much as you didn't want to do it, you had to destroy it and start over again? Anywhere, anyone been there with that? So I remember I, I was watching um, uh, Ready Player One with my kids. I don't know if you've ever, it's a great movie, but it, it, it reminded me of all the old video games I used to play. And so I'm going to totally date myself right now, but I remember in the early 80s, my family buying a home computer. Now, there was a time when uh, if a family had a home computer, you, you were making headway in, in life. And I remember with my family going to this place called LaBelle's. I don't know if anyone remembers LaBelle's. I remember going and my family and we were shopping for a home computer and none of us knew anything, right? All I was thinking was like war games, Matthew Broderick, like could I break into the Pentagon on this new home computer? And so, uh, so we bought this computer. It was a Commodore VIC-20. Now, I don't know if you guys remember <laughs> Commodore computer. So there was the VIC-20 model and there's the 64, right? So we had this Commodore VIC-20, and, and I remember like buying a couple first video games, and those first video games are not like Fortnite today. I mean, it was like a ball that went boop, 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 and we were all excited for that, right? <laughs> now it's like full VR immersion, and you know, but, and I remember buying a book, and I really begged my mom and dad to buy this book where you can enter your own program and build your own video game. And I was thinking to myself, this would be awesome. So I bought this book and it's just lines and lines of code. And I'm sitting there and I'm typing everything in. You know, you've got the symbols, you've got the, the asterisks, you've got the letters, you've got the numbers, and none of it looks like anything. But you know that this is code to eventually, once you put return, you're going to play a video game. And I remember the very first entry I was doing and I, I spent hours, it must have been four or five hours on a Friday night and I'm typing in all this code and I push enter and it said error. <laughs> and I'm going, you got to be kidding me. I've just spent four or five hours entering all this and how do you even go back and go, what symbol did I not get right? What symbol did I not enter? And I realized after four or five hours, I've got to start all over again. And I just remember that being such a defeating thing, right? Like, here we go again. And eventually the second time, it still didn't work. And you know what I did with that book? I threw it out the window. <laughs> I just said, I will be happy with Pong and, and we'll just settle on that. <laughs> you know, so. But I think we can all identify with pouring so much of ourselves into something and, th and that feeling of defeat and dissatisfaction going, why won't this work out? Why didn't this not turn out the way I, I had imagined or dreamed? And, and we come to a place in scripture where, where God has built something, created something so wonderful, and yet it's not working. And he has to destroy it and start again. This is, this is the narrative of, of the flood Noah's Ark, and, and this whole account. It's, it's creation that has to be destroyed in order for recreation to happen. Matter of fact, I want you to write down those two words, creation and recreation, because this is the narrative of God with humanity. The fact that, not that God didn't know what was going to happen, he's sovereign, he knew. But we see in Genesis how much his heart broke because creation chose to live apart from God's wisdom and his counsel. 
And it came to a point where there was all this wickedness and all this evil. And God said, I have to set reset on this. I have to destroy in order to make it better. And so the narrative of scripture is one of creation and recreation. So you have those two, two words in your column. We have number one, creation, Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And now you have the flood where he has to destroy and now recreate. But even after the, the ark and the flood, it is still the fact that even though there's a new creation, human hearts have not changed. They will not change. As if after the flood, no one is family land and everything is just peachy. It's not. And so now what you have is you have the story of God saying, now I need to do a creation and a recreation, not with the world, but now with the human heart. And you know how he does that? Through the mission and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus came so that we could be destroyed as humans in a figurative sense and be recreated to achieve what God wants us to achieve as humanity. That's why Paul says we are new creations in Christ. The old is gone, but the new has come. And one day there will be an ultimate recreation of the world where all the elements, earth and heavens will be destroyed and God will create a new heavens and new earth. So you think about the arc, right, of, this, of this, this narrative that there's creation and recreation, creation, recreation. God does these things to tell us that he is always up to doing a new work. And ultimately, we know his ultimate work will be perfect. It will be exactly the way he planned, and he will ultimately get the glory for it. But let's navigate this a little bit more together. And I want to talk about three points this morning. The first being the flood itself. The second being the ark. And then number three, the family that was inside the ark. And I want us to understand why God has put this account here. And again, this is not about putting murals in your kids' rooms because of the cutesy rainbows and animals that were aboard the ark. That's not what this is about. This is about... The, the account of God loving his creation so much that what he promised in Genesis 3, 15, that he will send a redeemer, that he will send a deliverer, that he will send a rescuer to do for us what we can never do for ourselves is exactly that. That is the greatest mission God has. He would rather die for us than live without us. And so we're gonna look at the flood, the ark, and the family. So turn your notes, grab a pen or pencil, or if you're doing it electronically and you're cool like that, take, it on your, take the notes on your tablet. But what we have here in the flood account is a clear reversal of Genesis chapter one. God is gonna wipe out everything he has created in order to set this family up for a new type of living. And well, and we'll call this as a typology. So even though we believe in the historicity of Noah and the ark and the flood, these are events that really happen. That they really point to some greater truths. And that's what typology means. You may want to write that word down because the Bible is filled with typology. And, and I'll define typology like this. It's a real person, place, or object or event that God ordained to act as a predictive pattern or resemblance of Jesus' person and work. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at all the elements of the account of the flood and see how they point to the greater reality that's found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So last week we looked at the obedience of Noah. This week we're going to look at the salvation of Noah. And it ties perfectly in with Communion Sunday and what John pointed us to. And that is the fact that we have a God who loves us and sent a Savior for us. So how do we trust him for salvation? How do we look to him to fulfill his promise that he will save us? Well, we're going to find out in this account. So here we go. Genesis chapter 6, starting at verse 14. Let's read through the rest of 6 into 7, and then we'll talk about the three major points this morning. Genesis 6, verse 14. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood, and you shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. So verse one, circle gopher word, uh, wood. Go ahead and, and circle the word pitch. These are important words we're going to come back to. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, and its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. A cubit was roughly 18 inches. So you may want to write that in the margin of your Bibles because it's important to understand the size of the ark. 
You shall make a window, circle window there, because the window's important. We're going to talk about that here in a bit. For the ark and finish it to the cu- a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark on the side of it. Circle the word door, because we need to talk about the door. These things are here for a reason. And, and what we're going to talk about may perhaps blow your mind. Uh, and you shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. They didn't call it promenade decks back then, but you can kind of envision it in your mind. And behold, even I am bringing a flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. This is a universal flood. It will take uh, precedence over the entire globe, okay? So this is a universal flood, not a local flood. This is going to wipe out everything on the planet earth. But I will establish, so this is an important shift in verse 18. My covenant, what is the covenant? Is the promise of God that he will send a deliverer. And as many people as that will die, the promise is those who will survive that God will be a redeeming God. This is a unilateral promise that God says, I'm going to stake and bank my character on this. And when you have God's word, you have God's word. And with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wives and, and sons' wives with you, and every living thing on the, uh, of, of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind. So two by two, right? Male and female, the animals are coming in, you know, they're invited to the ark. They're going to live with you. They're going to be male and female of the birds of every kind, of the animals of their kind, every creeping thing of the ground after its kind. Two of everything will come with you. Now, again, the critic of the Bible is going to say, how could something like the ark carry all the animals in the world? There's scientific proof that I'm going to show you how this is possible. We'll we'll look at that in a bit. But as for you, take for yourselves your sons, food, edible, uh, gather yourselves. And Noah did everything that God had commanded him to do. So there's the obedience of Noah, verse 22, right? As crazy as it was to do what he was asked to do, he did it. Now notice, Noah says nothing. Noah says nothing. This is what's amazing. He doesn't say anything in in chapter 6. He doesn't say anything in chapter 7. He doesn't say anything in chapter 8. He just does what God wants him to do. Are we like that? I don't know about you, but there's been times I've I've cried out to God. I've debated God. I've argued with God. Because just for some reason, does God ask us to do some things that it doesn't make sense to us? But yet that's the walk of faith, isn't it? But Noah doesn't say anything. He just does what God asks him to do. Verse 1, chapter 7. Then the Lord says to Noah, enter the ark. Instead of the word enter, the word is come. Come into the ark. Write that down. We're going to talk about that here in a bit. You and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. You shall take with you every clean animal by sevens, a male and a female. And now all of a sudden you have this number seven of animals. And here's why in chapter two, chapter three, there's a distinction of a certain animal group. These are the animals that are going to be used for worshiping God through sacrifice. See, what God is saying is that you are going to be a worshiping community and you need to bring animals to the altar to be a part of your worship. So therefore, there is a class of animals I want you to bring and they are denoted specifically for worship. As soon as this thing lands and you get on dry land and you establish your community, worship will be at the center. Verses 2, verses 3. For every, after seven more days, verse four, I will send rain on the earth 40 days, 40 nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I've made. So again, universal destruction. And Noah did all that God had commanded him. There it is again, verse five, right? Noah doesn't say a word. He just does what God asked him to do. Verse six, and now Noah was 600 years old when the flood water came upon the earth and Noah and his sons and his wife and their wives entered the ark because of the flood water. It was time to board the barge, Right? And of the clean animals and all the animals that are not clean and the birds and everything that creeps on the ground, they all went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded them. So you can imagine the scene, right? God says it's time to enter. They get on board and then all of a sudden the animals start coming. Verse 10, and it came about after seven days, the water of the flood came upon the earth, 600 year of Noah's life in the second month on the 17th day. Here's what's remarkable about the Bible, the specifics right? This is not some mythological Gilgamesh of epic, you know, uh, epic that describes this universal flood and this big square boat. And This is very precise. The writer wants you to know these are real events, and this is exactly when it happened. 
And so we see this, and on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were open. So there's water coming from two places, underneath the ground and out of the sky. And for 40 days and 40 nights, there's this deluge of water that will now cover the globe. And the rain fell on the earth for 40 days, 40 nights. Verse 13, on that very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, Noah's wife, and the three wives of the sons that were with them entered the ark. And every beast of its kind, and all the cattle and all the creeping things and all sorts of birds, verse 15, they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all the flesh that were, had the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered as God had commanded them, and God closed it behind them. Meaning, the door of the ark eventually was shut. And the flood came upon the earth for 40 days and the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it arose above the earth. And the water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth and the ark floated on the surface of the water. Noah did a good job, right? This thing's floating, all right? Can you imagine the, the celebration, right? And the water prevailed more and more so that even the highest mountains under the heavens were covered. Number one, so that the boat wouldn't hit any rocks and be damaged. But number two, perhaps there was humanity that thought they could escape the flood and go to the highest peak. And God made sure no one would survive. And the water prevailed 15 cubits higher and the mountains were covered. Verse 21, all flesh that moved on the earth perished. Birds and cattle, beasts, every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind, of all that was on dry land, all those nostrils with the breath of the spirit of life died. I mean, just stop right there and consider this account, right? Everything that had the breath of life in its nostrils perished. And thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animals, creeping things, and the birds of the sky, and they were blotted out from the earth. And only Noah was left together with those that were with him in the ark for a total of eight people. Out of millions of people, only eight. And the water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. The flood, a picture of God's judgment. For 120 years, Noah built the ark and preached righteousness. For 120 years, I've been alive for about a third of that. But for 120 years, Mo Noah built the, the ark and preached righteousness. God is patient. The message that there was going to come this universal flood, which was indicative of God's judgment, people were well aware of. And yet chose to ignore the warning. And so the flood is a picture of God's judgment that it is essentially creation undone. That God is going to do a new work of salvation, but that new work is going to come through judgment. That word judgment is not a judgment we like to use in our vo vo vocabulary. Anywhere from don't you judge me to the guy with the sandwich board on the corner of the street saying world judgment is at hand. And we sit there and go, woohoo lunatic, right? But yet the Bible is clear that judgment is coming. But what we need to think about is that judgment is just not God going off on a whim saying, you know, I just decide to destroy everything. He's a patient God who wishes not to bring judgment, but has to deal with this thing called sin and do something about eradicating sin from the hearts of sinners. And so he brings judgment. And when we think of judgment, we need to think about it in two ways. Judgment that will punish, but also judgment that will purge. And what we see in this is grace. And oftentimes when we say judgment or think about judgment, we're not thinking grace. But again, stop and consider how long God has ex exerted patience towards humanity. He has given them warning, and it wasn't just like a 24-hour, hey, heads up, tomorrow at this time, I'm wiping everybody out. 120 years, just in Noah building the ark and also preaching righteousness. But think about the time before that. 
God continue to, to strive with man and woman and say, don't live life according to your own terms. Live life the way I want you to live life because that is where you're going to find joy and that's where you're going to find wholeness. Being connected with your creator, not divorced from him. And so he says to humanity through Noah, here's the mouthpiece of God on earth, repent, turn, because judgment's coming. And what we have to realize is that even judgment that consists of punishing is predicated on this message of you don't have to be punished. So many times I think there's people that think of God as a punishing God and he delights in punishing. But he is a holy God, part of his character. And I would actually say the totality of the essence of God is his holiness. And when his holiness comes up against that which is so opposed to his holiness, there has to be justice. God is too kind and he is too good and he is too righteous to deal with anything that is an affront to his character. And so with even God judging as punishment, there's patience. Romans 2 verse 4, it is his kindness that leads us to repentance. People were warned. People were given a heads up. Hey, guess what? This is coming. He's going to judge the world through the flood. And it will be a total, universal judgment. So up to this point, it had never rained on the earth. So this idea of a total flood, people are like, whatever. You ever feel like your message just doesn't make sense to people? I mean, preaching the cross of Christ really does sound foolish, doesn't it? To the, to the modern hearer out there, you know, who is so advanced in their understanding of how things work, you're going to preach the message of the cross of Christ and think you're going to have a favorable audience for this? The Bible says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The message of universal flood? Noah, we're out in the middle of the desert. Noah, where's all this water going to come from? You go ahead and build your big barge because we're just happy over here eating, drinking, and being merry. Because no one had ever thought of something like this. And yet, once God decided it was time to begin, water came from below and water came from above. Since it had not rained on the earth because what watered the plants was this vapor that existed in the, in the, in the, in the, in the world, according to Genesis chapter 2, verse 6, there was this canopy of water which not only allowed things to be watered and to grow, but it allowed mankind to live into the hundreds. But once that canopy of water opened, the water from below and the water from above, it took 40 days, 40 nights for the total earth to be engulfed by this. And what a destruction it was. Without warning of when God was ultimately going to bring forth the judgment, even Jesus himself said, just like in the days of Noah, Jesus points and says, they were eating, they're drinking, they're, they're carousing, they're having a great time, but they were not prepared and thus they were wiped out. So the judgment has to do with punishment specifically for those who are not prepared for it. But the other side of the judgment we're talking about is purge, because with God's judgment on the earth through the flood, he's going to purge the earth. What is to purge mean? It means to cleanse, to make clean, to, to make better, to improve upon. And so he is going to clean the earth. And you need to think of purging, specifically how it points to the judgment of God, specifically through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Do you know that Jesus came to take the judgment for us and the purging of God against sin came via Christ? So that those who are now found in him, who believe in him, who look to him, now will not be judged by God because you don't want that. But we have a now a substitute who took the judgment upon himself who now purges and says, you are now clean if you come to God via me. That's the gospel, ladies and gentlemen. That there is one who came, who lived a perfect life, who now endures the judgment, the wrath, the punishment that you and I deserve, and yet he takes it for us. 
Anyone got a hallelujah out there? I know. Borderline charismatic. I know I'm stretching you guys. Too many of you still have those Baptist and Catholic roots in you. But when we talk about things like this, thank God he is not looking to you and your performance to get to heaven, but he's looking for you to look to Christ, that he's your ticket there. He's the sin bearer. He's the wrath bearer. He's the punishment bearer. And he does it so that you would not have to endure it because guess what? You never could. He is the one that we look to and say, thank you, God. You sent your son to die on my behalf. And if we're honest, I deserve punishment. If I'm honest, you deserve punishment. But God said, no. There's going to be a storyline here that points to how good I am. I mean, really, this is the glory of God. This is the exaltation of a creator who could have been totally right and just to destroy it all and not start over. But somehow, someway, God is glorified in all of this. And I thank God for the judgment that has to do with purging and my identification with Christ that no longer do I stand condemned and no longer do I stand under this idea of being judged because now I'm no longer a slave, but now I'm a son of God. And you're no longer a slave, you're a daughter of God and a son of God. And now we can rejoice because our Savior took the judgment for us. Woo! We can stop right there, but there's more. There's more, but wait. God is not some arbitrary God who, you know, I'm reading about these cops in Georgia. You hear about this? They pulled the woman over for speeding and they decided on how they're going to deal with her by flipping a coin. Did you hear about this? So they go back to the car. So this woman's basically, she could get a speeding ticket or she was so far over the speed limit, it could be a speeding ticket with this, in, uh, this ticket that's also um, reckless driving and much worse punishment. And so these two female cops don't know how to deal with this one. So they go back to the car and there's an app and they flip the coin on the app and there's all this dash cam footage taking the recording of all this. And they basically arrest her. She gets the harsher of the punishment because the coin flip. And those women that following week were fired from the force because all the, the body cam footage came back. God, God doesn't do that with us. God doesn't sit there and go, hey, Cheryl, let's see, heads or tails? Heads heaven, tails hell. Here we go, right? Like, James, you're not off the hook, brother. You call it. Call it in the air, right? If I know James, it's tails never fails. Up heads, you're going to hell. Like, God is not this arbitrary, capricious, like, let's just trust everything. That no, God is very deliberate in saying, no, we're not going to leave this to a gamble. We're not going to leave this to chance. I'm going to let you know very clearly right here, right now, there is a way to be saved. You come to me on my terms, and here's the terms. You either try to make it on your own and be punished, or you come to my son and find purging. What's it going to be? Because this is exactly what the ark points to. Point number two. The ark is a picture of God's rescue. The only way to be saved in Noah's day before the flood was to get on that barge. There's no other way. It wasn't like God said, hey, everyone else, go ahead and put together your little you know, floating vessel. You know, you're out there building kayaks and catamarans and no, 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 no. It wasn't like you just go ahead and build whatever boat you want. No, no, here's the plan. My servant Noah is building this ark. You get on board. And if you don't get on board that boat, you will be destroyed. So for 120 years, Noah's building this behemoth of a vessel. He's preaching righteousness. He's doing this building. Now, again, we need to wrap our minds around this barge because it, the, the, the building of the barge points to so many beautiful realities that are found in the personal work of Jesus Christ. But here's what the barge is not, okay? Let's just get rid of some of our preconceived notions of Noah's Ark. So what we have first is it's not the love boat. I mean, who didn't have a crush on Julie, right? And who didn't like gopher? And who wouldn't want to drink a Mai Tai served by Isaac? I mean, it's not the love boat. 
And, but it's not the Titanic either. I mean, again, as horrible as that movie was, I hate the Titanic. You know why I hate it? I know how the movie's going to end. Guys, it sinks. I just saved you guys 250 in rental fees, all right? It's not the Titanic. But it's also not what I talked about last week. I mean, when you talk about judgment, this is not what you're thinking of. <laughs> and you know, the bigger their eyes, the cuter they are. This is not this. Don't be going to point, paint this in your kid's bedroom unless you're willing to throw some corpses in the water, right? The next picture, nor is it this. Maybe for the older children in your family, this is not what God wants us to, to wrap our minds around. These next couple of pictures are more in line with what the Bible's. No, this is not it either. This is at the Ark Encounter, and I don't know where it is, Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, Russia. I don't know where this is, but no, no, no go back to that picture. You have to think about the fact that Noah's not a carpenter. This came, this, <laughs> this came out of, you know, this looks like it came out of like, you know, this old house on PBS, right? Uh, this is not Nick Offerman wood time, right? Like, look how, who, how smooth those curves are. Like, this is not, as much as the Ark Encounter wants you to understand notes, this is not the Ark. But the next picture gets close. It's a big box. Right? It's a big box with a ladder on it. Like, all right, let's get in. One door, everyone in right now. But the next picture I think is probably the best. There it is. And, and, and if I was to ask you what that first looks like, for me, a coffin. The word ark literally means coffin. Now think about this. Here's the cutesy out the window. Here's all the big-eyed pandas out the window. When you're thinking coffin, you're not thinking happy, happy, joy, joy, right? You're not, you're not thinking this. You're thinking coffin, you're thinking death. You're thinking the end. You're thinking something scary. You're thinking something dark. You're thinking something oppressive. Only other time the word ark appears in the Bible, in this language of, of we call Hebrew of the Old Testament, is with baby no, uh, Moses being sent down the river in an ark. Literally coffin, because when Moses' mother sent that baby down the river, she's thinking this baby is going to die. Here's the voyage of death which according to God's sovereignty in Moses' case, eventually led to life. We ought not be afraid of death as believers in Christ. What this symbolizes is I am entering a coffin, a vessel of death, it, which is really the reality of it, right? Like I am kissing my will my ways, my agenda away, and I'm entering something that I have no control over. I am dying to myself because this has nothing to do with me and I have no power to control this, but I'm gonna enter this vessel of death and trust God that he's gonna be faithful to his word to deliver. The wood that's used on the ark, it's called gopher wood. Gopher wood was used by ancient cultures to build coffins. It is the most endurable wood, durable wood in the world. As a matter of fact, St. Peter's gates in Rome from the time of Constantine to a thousand years later were built by gopher wood and over a thousand years through weather and storm withstood all those things being stable and durable and perfect. The pitch that says held all the wood together and filled in all the gaps. The word pitch literally means, you ready for this? Atonement. So now you have a coffin, this symbol of death held together by this material called pitch, which means atonement. Do you think God's trying to say something to us through this? that the only thing that's going to hold this coffin of death together will be the atonement. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is such a beautiful picture of, again, what Christ has done for us. Notice, too, the, the language that's used in this, 
this account that this ark that's made of wood and is held together by this pitch that literally means coffin is not a small vessel. It's a huge vessel. Think about the, 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 the measurements of this thing. 450 cubits by 75 cubits by 45 cubits. Literally, write this down in your notes, 1.5 million cubic square feet of space. Three levels that would be perfectly adequate to hold every living creature, both male and female of its kind. Now, scientists have said, could this barge really hold all these animals? Let me just tell you right now, world-leading taxonomist tells us that there are almost 1.1 species of animals in the world. But included in that are ones that are, are animals that live in the water. Do those need to go on the boat? Okay, so we can eliminate that. You know how many are eliminated? If you eliminate the water creatures, we are now down to 35,000 species. Now you got to bring two of every kind, male, female, right? Because they got to, you know, get it on, right? So now we're talking about 70,000 species of animals. Right, 35,000 times two, 70,000. Most of us begin to go, well, still, that seems like a lot. And we tend to think of the big animals, don't we? Like the elephants and the giraffes and the hippos. Most land animals are actually smaller than your average size sheep. You know how many sheep you can put on one railroad freight car? If it's double layer, 240 per railroad car. And you know, when you're driving and you're like, my family, we love going to San Diego, right? We always see the trains. And we're like, hey, count the cars. They're like every parent's like ruse, right? Like quit fighting. Hey, count the, you know, count the train cars, right? Let me just tell you, if 240 sheep can occupy one train car and say you took one train and it had 65 cars behind it, how many animals could you fit on the train cars and how many train cars would you need? Listen to this. The size of the ark is nine trains. You would only need four to have all the animals on board. Meaning, you bring all the animals on board this barge, you're using 40% of the space necessary. Which now leaves 60% space for your family, for, for food, and indoor racquetball or whatever else you need for entertainment. So when you break down the numbers, this barge is more than adequate to not only save two of every species, but also eight people have plenty of food and plenty around to move because you know how long they're going to be in this barge. They're going to be in there for 371 days. But God knows what he's up to. He knows exactly how to deliver these people. He knows how to take care of his creation. And that's why we need to consider these things in, in, in light of, of two wonderful truths about the ark. Because the ark is basically an invitation to be saved. Mo Noah is given clear instructions by God that this is the only vehicle to be saved. So number one, it is an invitation into indestructibility. Good luck spelling that, but I bet you'll get close. It is an invitation in this. What God says is that I will give you a plan and I'm going to send you an invitation in order to come into something that will never be destroyed. The design of the ark was not Noah's, it's God's. And it was the very thing that was going to be able to withstand the deluge of flood. But not only that, to ultimately find land once all that water receded 371 days later. And again, if the message is an invitation into destructibility, what does that tell us about our Savior, Jesus Christ, who says to us, once you come to me, no one could ever remove you from my love. No one could ever destroy the work I'm going to do in you. Once I have got you, I've got you. When you are invited into the coffin of dying to yourself and saying yes to Jesus and no to you, you are covered with atonement pitch, baby. And that will never, ever be affected by anything in this world because once you're saved, you're always saved. And there's nothing in heaven, nothing on earth. There's no principalities, no angels, nor death, nor anything that could destroy the work of God in you according to Romans chapter 8. 
you are secure. But not only is it an invitation to something that is indestructible, unlike the things we try to build that we think are indestructible and get destroyed right before our very eyes. Your own man-made religion, your own spirituality, your own religious texts, you name it, there's people that are buying into things that they think are going to save them, and yet they're sincerely wrong about that which is going to save them. This is why we preach the cross of Christ. But the second thing is an invitation into intimacy. Because you can't miss verse 1 of chapter 7. God tells Noah, come into the ark. Can you imagine like he's building, everything's looking good, it's, it's looking complete. And all of a sudden when God says it's time, it's time. And verse 1 of chapter 7 is such an intimate verse because God really, with just a few words, says to Noah, your work here is done. Now it is time to come into your place of refuge. It is time to come into your place of safety. Come into the ark. And can I tell you how wonderful that word come is? It, is? it is used throughout scripture in the sense of a warm invite by a loving God to a humanity that is desperate without him and to hear him say to you, come into my love, come into my care, come into my security. And it is one of those words that is found throughout scripture, not just in Genesis chapter seven, but it's also found in Isaiah chapter 55 verse one where the prophet Isaiah reminds us of the word, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Isaiah is, is no stranger to understand the holiness of God, and he's no stranger in understanding that he has nothing that could ever bring him into God's good graces, and that's why these words ring true even for us, because we sit there and go, who am I? I'm not rich enough. <laughs> I'm not smart enough. And God says, exactly. Come and drink and drink till your heart's content. And I realize you don't deserve it, but you're going to get it. And that's why the words of, of Jesus are so remarkable too in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, when he says, come to me all you who are labor and are heavy laden and I'm going to give you rest. There's an invitation to intimacy that we fall short of the glory of God. We don't have enough resources. We don't have enough money. And God says, I will feed you. I will slake your thirst but you who are burdened, and I don't know what you're burdened by this morning, but in Jesus' day, they were burdened by a whole lot of stuff, but he elicits a simple invitation. Come to me. Come into relationship with me, and I will give you, what's the word? Rest. Can we just say that word one more time? Because there's some of you that are saying the word, but you don't know what that word means. Come to me and I will give you rest. Isn't that the deepest hunger and longing of our hearts? To know that no matter who we are and what we've done, and that with a God like the one we are talking about this morning, he says, I invite you into intimacy. And with intimacy with the Almighty, it has nothing to do with doing. It just has to do with being. I will rest with you, Christ. And the very last chapter of the, the book of Revelation says this, the spirit of the bride say, come. Let the one who hears come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who desires to take the water of life without price come. I mean, <laughs> I just taken you through the entire Bible. And what is it? It is God's tender voice saying to you and me today, come and find an intimate relationship like none other. Amen? Amen. Where is your place of refuge today? Wh who is your ark that you are stepping into and going to survive all the floods that are going on around us. Because all of us are experiencing cataclysmic events in our lives. 
at a, it could be a, a relationship, it could be someone with your spouse, it could be a job, it could be something with your health. I don't know what it, but there's no one in this room that is immune from cataclysmic events in our lives. And the, the greatest question I can ask you is, where are you seeking refuge? Because with Christ, not only is his love indestructible, but he offers an intimate relationship that says, while the storms are raging outside, you've got me and I've got you and this is going to be okay. Amen? And I pray you know that today before it's too late. See, I'm, I'm talking about preparation. Because if you don't have Jesus, you're not prepared. I don't care how hefty your, your retirement account is. I don't care if your home's paid off. I don't care if you have great health. I don't care if you have all these relationships that are stress-free. Liar. Uh, <laughs> you're just choosing to ignore those things that God's saying, deal with it, right? The reality of it is this. None of us are going to go through life on a day-to-day -day ba day basis without the floods happening. But the question is not about what you have or what you've done. The question is, who do you know? And if God is your shepherd and with him you shall not want, and even though he may lead you to those green pastures, he's also going to walk with you through the valley of the shadow of death. Because you know the journey with the great shepherd is one that ultimately leads to a table in the wilderness where you are sitting down, you're supping with him who is indestructible, you're supping with him who is perfect, and he's telling you, no one will ever take you away from me. John chapter 10. Which brings us to our last point. Are you a part of the family? Which is a picture of God's people. See, this is not only an, intimate, uh, an invitation to intimacy with God. This is an invitation to intimacy with, with God's people because guess what? We need each other. And this is the hardest aspect probably of our faith. It's like we're good with God, but we're not good with each other. You know why? Because so often we, we act like two starving ticks on a dead dog. You know what I'm saying? Like there, there's conflict and there's battling and there's war and, and we're humans, right? And we're still dealing with selfishness and we're dealing with pride. And whether it be our relationship as friends or husbands and wives and with our kids, we are still people who are dealing with the impact of sin on our life. But God has given us a context where we can smooth out those rough edges. And that's called the church. There's people that have been hurt by church. There's people that have been abused by church. And, and, and I will tell you that Christians are notorious to be the worst people as far as their love and treatment of each other. Has anyone ever experienced that? Some of you are like, I don't, am I allowed to lift up my hand right now? There's not some guy in the back writing down your name like, oh, get them this week, right? When I say it's an invitation to the family, this is not like Marlon Brando Godfather, like who is part of the family? Take out who isn't, right? You know, like we're not talking that. This is an invitation to say, I want you to accept me as I am imperfections and all. Because guess what? There's no one in this room that is perfect. There's no one in this room that's spot free. There's no one here that doesn't have issues or problems and doesn't yell at their spouse and doesn't yell at their kids and doesn't maybe do unethical things at work and doesn't do, you know, we all have those things. And yet this is the context where God is saying, I want to make you more like Jesus. And what does that mean? It means the two things. R number one, that God is going to save his people. And number one, God has got, uh, he secures his people. And we don't need each other questioning the saving and we don't need each other questioning the securing. Christians are really good at making you feel insecure about your faith. Oh, you don't pray 10 times a day? Well, what's wrong with you? Oh, you don't read the Bible in the original languages of Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic? What's your problem? Oh, you don't worship God in music by lifting up your hands? I knew one guy who was totally unacquainted with church culture, and there's a guy singing, raising his hand, and this guy leans over and goes, are they allowed to ask questions during the music? Right, like we're really good about making each other feel so, like, you don't know about the cross? You don't know where Genesis is? Loser! 
This is not an invitation to a culture like that. This is an invitation into a culture that says we will love each other through all the difficulties, through all the imperfections, through all the messy stuff. The pooping and the crying, yes. It doesn't only happen with infants. It happens with you guys. It happens with me. Are you guys good with a pastor that poops? Are you guys good with that? That's a tweet moment right there if I ever heard one, right? You guys, I make messes. You make messes. Can, can we put up with each other in our messes? Knowing that God has got a plan where he is saving his people and he is secure in saving those people. We have security in Christ, amen? So think about what God does here as we close out this, this account. All the animals are on board. Did Noah have to go out and wrangle up all the animals? I mean, you, you can be like, ruff, ruff, like get all the dogs on board, right? Or meow, meow, get all the kitties on board, right? Like how do you like even get the hippos, right? It's like, ruff, 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 what sound do they make? But who's in control of bringing the animals on board the boat? God. Now think about this. Here's the sovereign call of God in action where mankind is ignoring the voice of God to come the animals don't even bat an eye they're coming this is where creation puts us to shame the Bible says all creation worships God and if not humanity Jesus says the rocks would cry out and declare the greatness of God and yet we who are created with the volitional power to worship him choose not to? Here's, here's the animals saying we're going to follow our creator's voice. They're coming on board. Why? Because God's calling them on board. And I will tell you, God is saving people because of the internal call he has upon their hearts. And here's the good news for us. Let's take a little bit of burden off our shoulders. You will never save anybody. Can I get an amen to that? I can't tell, I, I lived early part of my Christian life thinking I could save people. That's a tough job. I would debate with people until I was blue in the face. You did, you know, like, you know, blood shooting out of my eyes. And, and God's like, Morgan, settle down. You will never save anybody. Because while I may give this external call to come to Christ, who's doing the inward call? It's God. He will save whom he wants to save. And up to the point when he decides to close the door of the ark. Are you glad he didn't ask Noah to close the door of the ark? Can you imagine how tough that would have been? Like, Noah, it's time to close the ark. And there he goes out and he's looking at all of humanity. That's basically going to be destroyed. Like, I think there was enough of a compassionate, merciful heart in Noah that he probably wouldn't have, he probably would have delayed. No, no, no. We need more people on board. We've got, we've got plenty of space. And yet God says, you sit in the ark. And at my appointed time, I will close the door. Why? Because Jesus Christ in John 10 says he is the door. And no one will enter but through him. And so the door is open. Because there's no universal judgment happening right here, right now. Thank God. But God is preparing to close the door. But in the meantime, there's still people that can be saved. My question is, are we going out with that message to remind people of the importance that this world will eventually be destroyed, but those who are in Christ will never be destroyed? Enter the door. And he's also the lock on the door because once he shuts it, no one can open it, right? Revelation chapter three, verse seven, we're reminded of the words that says, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. He's got this. And there's a ceiling that happens when God says, I'm going to shut the door and I'm going to lock the door. That there's a ceiling that happens that no one apart from God could ever disturb. And praise God for the ceiling we have by means of the Spirit, which is a reminder for us from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. Where Paul says these words, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. 
The fact that God says, I've got you, you're secure, there's nothing to worry about. So not only is God saving, and he's still saving to this day, that once you're saved, you're secure in him, and he's going to get you through the floodwaters and ultimately get you to level safe ground because the salvation is not based upon you, it is based upon his promise. Aren't you thankful for the secure love of God in Jesus Christ? Now we're getting there. You guys are feeling it. I can tell. But this is good news because we are in this together. No man is an island when it comes to the church, to God being God's people. No woman is an island. I, I was, maybe this is just me. Have you been driving around the valley and seen like these bikes? Green bikes just kind of sitting on the sidewalk? You know what this is, right? Cities are adopting this. Hey, ride bikes more. But the problem is like, you don't have to take the bike anywhere. You can just leave it. And all of a sudden you're right. I was in San Diego. They do scooters out there, which is really cool. You're driving around San Diego and there's all these just lonely scooters on the sidewalk. Matter of fact, NPR just did a story of these people and I think it's in DC. People are actually hurting themselves because they're walking probably on their phones right? and they're tripping over these scooters that someone just decides like, I'm going to abandon this thing here. And I'm looking at the bikes and I'm looking at the scooters and I'm thinking about how many people feel like those scooters and those bikes. Just kind of abandoned and left. And it's like, no, 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 they deserve more. You were designed for something more and you were designed for each other. And we as humanity, you don't go through this thing alone. We need each other, amen? And so this is the message to us today that we need each other, no matter how hurt we may be, no matter how banged up we may be, God's got a purpose for us. So let us, according to Hebrews chapter 10, write this verse down, verses 24, 25. Let us not give up encouraging one another all the more as we see the day drawing near. There is a day of judgment coming, but if you're part of God's people because of Jesus, we can navigate this together. Amen? You need me, I need you. Can we pursue life together in this context? You better believe it. I pray you've been encouraged. Next week, chapter eight of Genesis, we're making headway. Thank you, Lord. Let's stand, let's pray. Father, my prayer this morning is for the church, this people, this community gathered and I would be foolish to assume that everyone has entered the ark of Christ. And Lord, in ways that you know how to do and only you can control, draw all men and all women to your son, please. If there's anyone here that does not know Christ in an intimate way, may today be the day of salvation. May they hear your tender voice calling them to come to him who offers rest, who offers joy, who offers life. Lord, forgive us for trying to do things on our own and thank you for the reminder that without Christ, we will continue to be empty and desolate. But with Christ, we are secure in your love and positioned for an eternity of glory with you. So thank you for the reminder to, again today for Jesus, who is our everything. We rejoice in him who is our door, who is our shepherd, who is our rock, who is our refuge. Thank you for the riches of knowing him. Be glorified in our lives, Father. Remind us of these truths this week. Be glorified in all things. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face towards you and give you grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day. Get to know someone you've never met before. We'll see you soon, all right? Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out thechurchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.